All right, folks. <laughs> this is uh, Alan English here with uh, Alfie Pritchard, and uh, today we're going to be discussing on our podcast here, Creativity and Madness at the Tea House Theatre. Uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, eugenics and mental health. I do believe. So we're going to be, you know, making some quotes here from. Uh, so, you know, writers such as Darian Black, James Davies, and Franz Kafka, among others. Alfie. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, and by the way, this is going to be our last podcast, isn't it? Yeah, until, last podcast for this year. And, yes, and until the new year. Um, Assuming we both survive till 2022, yeah. okay, it's just going to be our last podcast for this year, and we pick up in 2022. Assuming um, we survive till then, but we won't pick I'm, up in 2022. I'm going to talk about, um, I'm not going to quote from it, I'm just going to sort of work out some ideas from Touch With Fire, Manic Depressive Illness and the Artistic Temperament by K. Redfield Jameson. We've spoken about it quite a lot actually, but um, the other month I began to read her again. Um, I admire her a hell of a lot. And one of the reasons I admire her is because I can argue against her at the same time. I, I don't agree with everything that she says. Um, I won't go into that in this one. I mean, Touch With Fire is literally about, it's, it's mostly about poets who suffered terribly from manic depression. And the reason she uses poets to talk about manic depression is because they're poets they get to the heart of the actual horror of what it is to be manic depression, you know, uh, to suffer the torment of, of madness. Um, and it's, it's a no holds barred book in many ways, particularly when it talks about Byron and Poe. Um, you know, you come away with like, wow, now I can understand what they were really trying to get at. But I want to talk about something that she touches upon at the end of this book, um, and, and we'll, come, we'll come to it um, when Alan starts talking about some of the um, people that we're going to discuss in a, in a moment. Um, and it, what struck me, what crystallised for me is what is happening now in popular culture and particularly the idea of eugenics making a return almost it's almost invisible but it's there we live in, in a new age of eugenics and that is coming to the front particularly in mental illness um, I'm speaking now because it's okay. Right, right. Alan, over to you. Yeah, I, I stopped. Okay, the... right. Okay, you know, Arthur, regarding eugenics, I mean, it's uh, basically, in this context, we're reading about, you know, through James Davies and Darian Leader. And uh, Darian Leader, you know, in his work, he fundamentally argues that uh, grief is a, a part of life and the healthiest way that we humans have found of de uh, in dealing with grief for those whom we love to have passed on is to imbue the process of grief with meaning and with ritual as a kind of way of dealing with you know, of, of death and what James Davies you know, author and you know, Daddy and Leader explores this uh, his process uh, this of, the, of how we deal with you know, death and, and grieving in his book, uh, The New Black, Mourning, Melancholy and Depression. And James Davies, in his book, Cracked, Why, Psycholo Why Psychiatry is Doing More Harm Than Good. And that's, that basically you know, looks at how the whole, how everything that human feeling basic human feeling, human, natural human reactions to traumatic events in life are essentially being medicalized and they're being medicalized for profit. 
so it's uh, no longer okay not to be okay anymore. There has to be something profoundly wrong with you. If you are not okay, you need to be cured. If you are not okay, you need to be made normal if you are not okay. And this is this is actually quite worrying, according uh, you know, to, to James you know, Davies. And you know, it's, it, it, it basically discusses how the, kind of the, uh, the origins of uh, you know, the, uh, the, the DSM, which is like the, uh, the Diagnostic Statistical uh, Manual, and how, the, how this came about. Let's, let's double check what that is. Yeah, the, you know, the, the DSM, it, it came about largely by yeah, uh, Diagnostical and Statistical Manual of mental disorders, the DSM. And this came about by, uh, not through scientific research into mental disorders, but into a group of doctors sitting down without hypothesizing, without researching, without experimenting or, you know, with their ideas or, or, or coming to their conclusions about their theories. They basically sat down and had a discussion as to what did and did not constitute a mental disorder and it was this largely unscientific process that was the basis for what became known as the DSM and if you think about it and you, you know anything about science and the way that you know science is is conduct, conducted you know how people you know, you know, the basic you know, foundations of science you have a hypothesis okay you uh, you work out ways of proving this hypothesis and then you come to conclusions that scientific process was completely disregarded and that's quite frightening you know because when it comes to this because you've come up with these essentially made up psychological disorders for which people are propounding and selling made up medical solutions and it completely ignores the uh, the proper process well, well, not proper, the time-honoured process that we've had throughout, as human beings throughout the centuries of managing grief. So in a sense, we've, uh, we've stopped worshipping God and we've started worshipping the pill, basically. God is not the cure to all our woes, the pill is. And, you know, we've, tra we've traded in one religion for another, but this is a religion that more than relig but uh, more than the worship of God or the worship of gods ever was, it's you know the worship of the pill is a religion that is based on profit and is driven by profit to a far greater degree you know, than, than than the gods ever were. You know, it's, uh, and it's it is genuine. It's it's screwed up in a big way the way we look at you know mental illness and the way we deal with mental illness. And it's, you know, I've, you know, I've got a, you know, a number of kind of vital quotes here that kind of look at it. Uh, and um, I'm going to look at this here. Pe okay, uh, I'm going to look at the quotes because we've been researching this for weeks now. You know, as to what could, you know, uh, you know as, you know, this, this thing. Right, so I'll, I'll look at this now. Because myths, you know, because, you know we, we always seek answers to kind of like the big questions of our lives. And, you know, and this is where myths and more broadly speaking, religion have found, have, you know, a fundamental purpose in that they supply these meanings, these answers to our questions, which are otherwise missing for us. And I want, I want a quote here from, uh, you, know, you know, from Cracked here. We must un first unpack what is meant by the term myth. You know, to do this, let me share with you an event that uh, my friend once told me concerning his, his five-year-old daughter. He was driving her home along a country road late one clear summer's night. She had been looking out of the car window the whole time. And after about 20 minutes, she finally spoke up. Daddy, she asked with great seriousness, why is the moon following us home? The poetry of the question took him so off guard that he mumbled something about near objects seeming to pass by quicker than distant objects. 
because of relative distances and so forth. His daughter wasn't impressed. I think the moon is following us home because it's lonely. With this conclusion she appeared satisfied. She picked up her book and started humming contentedly to herself. She now had her myth. We are not so different from that little girl. We seek myths to crucial questions for which we have no clear answers but about which we feel we need answers so that we may turn our attention to other things. This is why every society throughout time has had its multifarious myths about all aspects of life, about where we are from, about where we are going, about why we are here and so on. Myths help soothe our anxieties about some of our most fundamental human uncertainties. Take one of the greatest uncertainties of all. What happens to us after death? This issue provokes such universal anxiety that anthropologists haven't found a single community upon this vast globe that doesn't have a myth about the afterlife. One community speaks of ethereal angels awaiting us at pearly gates. Another of a cosmic mother we'll all return to after death. Another of gamboli ancestors welcoming us with barrels of manioc wine. The myths are everywhere. All telling fantastically different stories, but all in effect serving the similar purpose of providing explanations for questions that, if left unanswered, could drive many of us to mad distraction. Myths speak to the realms of life that matter most, including whence comes and how goes our suffering, a matter for which, in contemporary Western societies, we turn to psychiatrists for help. <laughs> Suddenly, I remembered something. Well, I haven't remembered. It was smacking our faces. The last two weeks, we've had a conference, a world conference, yes. um, in Glasgow, which I started to follow. And I realised that what was going on in that conference was, was quite schizophrenic. You had world leaders speaking about the end or the possibility of the end of nature, the end of the human race. And then you had the activists, these young idealists, these um, poets, artists, creative thinkers, who to me were speaking the truth because it's their world. Um, and listening to what Adam was just reading about the power of myth. We've lost that, I think, in our culture, in this modern, postmodern culture. So, what was going on last week adds, I think, for young people in particular, to a multitude of anxieties. Of, um, life, it is a matter of life and death for them, it's real. The politicians, the inventors, the scientists, the great minds spoke absolute rubbish, apart from one or two, who, who had passion and conviction. So what we're told, it's a bit of a change for me, listening to what Alan was saying just then. Um, the importance of believing in the myth of an ancient myth rather than the modern myth that we can solve everything by a tablet, by a drug, by forgetfulness um, is very important. I just want to take, there was one important issue about an island that had disappeared in the Pacific and an anthropologist spoke to the people on this island and how he did it, he said through your stories, through your myths that go back in time, is there any, anything that mentions such a destruction that is going on on your island now? The sea levels are rising very fast and they say there's nothing. All our myths are about the beauty of life. What we're seeing now is, the, is something totally different. It's the death of, of life as we know it for the human race. Um, yeah, I've just charged into that, um, which is going to bring me back to um, Touch With Fire and Eugenics and our, our reliance on the, on the image 
our reliance on the spectacle of the image. Um, somewhere along the line, along the way, we've actually forgotten who we are. And that's quite, that's quite damning. We've, we've also forgotten about the Second World War, one of our subjects that we always come back to, about eugenics. I think we're living in a new age of eugenics, not just about the destruction of the planet, but also about how we live ourselves in this culture, in this globalised world. Alan, do you want to carry on or shall I carry on? Yeah, I mean... I I, I've gone off the subject a bit, I know. No, no, no. I mean, I'd like to come back I mean, to the uh, kind of the idea of grief, and this is yeah. explored a little bit. And I'm, I'm going to quote from Darian Leader now. And I might go back into James mm. Davies, you know, in, mm. you know, in just a little bit. But you know, this um, I think when we I'm, I'm quoting from uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm quoting from uh, you know, from uh, Jim from Darian Leader here. This whole about the process of grief. And it goes like this, when we lose a loved one, we have lost a part of ourselves. And this loss requires our consent. We might well tell ourselves that we have accepted a loss, but acquiescence and true consent are fundamentally different. Many people indeed go through life obeying others while harboring a burning resentment within themselves. Mm. They say yes without meaning it. In the same way, a small child might follow the demands of potty training out of fear without ever having really agreed to them. In mourning, we have to consent at the deepest level to the loss of a part of ourselves. That's why, as we have seen, it involves an additional sacrifice. It implies logically that the only way to give up the image we took on for someone else is to question the way we imagined they looked at us. I want to kind of go into you know, this, uh, this, this thing and... Yeah, I want, I want to look a little bit more at the, you know, the, you know, I mean, you know, the, the what the was going on, on, Alan, in this so-called two-week conference? Yeah. It is about loss. Yeah. I mean, I mean, here you had these people, these cultures from, um, from the Pacific Islands talking about loss. They were talking about their, their whole way of life. Is disappearing. On the opposite side, side of the coin, I'll go back to this, you have the great inventors, the great scientists, um, who were denying, I think, a sense of grief, a sense of mourning. We should have been in, you know, the young people got that, the young activists, they got that. You know, for them, this sense of loss, this sense of mourning, it's very, very important. It's, it's part of their movement. Um, but somehow, the voices of the people whose land and whose islands were being lost, we've forgotten about it already. We don't know how to mourn anymore. We don't know what grief is. In our culture, I'm talking about, we don't understand what that really means. And that's why what Alan's reading, I think, is very, very important. No, I mean, we've essentially, I think we've, we've, we've fundamentally, we've kind of swapped that, uh, for, you know, and kind of abandoning our rituals, abandoning mm. religion. We have abandoned the uh, our connection with society. I mean, this is a thing with, we have lost something through our progress, you know, in our, our technology and the way it has consumed the resources of our planet has disconnected us from the planet. You know, and I, I, I say that because we're, we're doing this blooming podcast on a piece of technology in itself, so mm. that might be a kind of irony slash yep. hypocrisy <laughs> in my saying this. But even so, I mean, our addiction to technology that has, you know, kind of reduced our need for sweaty labour and has. In engaged us with all sorts of demented distractions. I mean, the internet, my God, a blooming kaleidoscope of, you know, of moving images. You know, it's, and it's kind of, it's, 
it's almost in a way it's gone too far it has disconnected us from ourselves and all of it is motivated by money new gadgets new projects new, new, new gadgets new products you know new new money and it's, oh my god it's, it's, it's absolutely gone bloody mad and yeah. that gets back to how we originally started this podcast when we started talking about the um, eugenics of how we've forgotten we've actually forgotten history our own western history in, in the last century we've forgotten about the great war we romanticised the great war but we've actually forgotten about it We've forgotten about the, the so-called, um, the great industries that were coming on. What we have forgotten about as well is the 1920s, 1930s and 1940s. We've forgotten about the eugenics, the new man, the new ideology, um, the great image of a great nation states um, that led to one place and one place only, death. Sorry to be so bleak, you know, bleak about it, but our memories are made up with false history because our own history in the last hundred years has been one of a meat grinder walking across the across the planet, devouring and then spitting out the bones and the innards of the human race. In the name of what? eugenics okay <laughs> there's, a, there's a profit this I mean this this idea of of uh, this human ideal of perfection a perfect society mm. a, a perfect mind a perfect body I and mean, uh, our, our pursuit of uh, perfection it, to, uh, 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 Christopher uh, Hitchens argued this, the pursuit of perfection in society is essentially the pursuit of death. Uh, that if we were the, the, and it's, 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 it, is some, it is something to be, you know, the, the perfection is no longer an ideal, it is a product to be packed, to be created, to be manufactured, packaged and sold. The public and it's, it's it's fundamentally an illusion but it's an illusion that keeps people rich and a lot of people poor and kills and you know basically kills the planet as well and our connection with you know and, and, and kills kills the nature because you're dr you're drawn you're draining the resources of this planet for the sake of creating this illusion and I'm thinking of a poet now a poet friend, you know, uh, poet is a friend of mine who was, uh, you know, was, his name was uh, Shaka and he had this uh, terrific, you know, poem about sweet dreams and beautiful nightmares. And he can finish it, you know, with this, with this line, there will be no sweet dreams while we marvel at the beauty of this nightmare. And that's what we think. We, we won't be able to dream well when we marvel at the beauty of this. It's essentially this nightmare that we have created, you know, through our pursuit of the unattainable, the unattainable perfection. Yeah. Well, this it's, is it's almost grotesque. Hmm. You know, perfect, but perfect minds. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it, celebrity culture is embedded in this. You know, it, 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 the literal embodiment of the idea of you know perfection. You know, these these people with multi-millionaire lifestyles. Uh, it's absolutely ins it's absolutely insane if you really think about it. And fame is sold as something that will kind of cleanse you of your imperfections. And. It, it doesn't, you know, because far from it, I mean, you see it, your fame doesn't cleanse you of your imperfections. In fact, it magnifies them. Ooh. And what, it's, it's one of these, it's, uh, it's a distraction. And our pursuit of it and our obsession with it, again, it's fundamentally a distraction. Because we're, I think we're afraid now to look at the, you know, the genuine realities of living. You know, because you know, it's become... It's almost become too much for us because 
because of that detachment we have from society, we're too afraid to deal with the realities of living in that society. It's, it's coming out a lot in our art, in our culture, and in our politics. I mean, uh, because we, in this country, you know, we've got a, a political class who live in Westminster. Now, I've often heard London being described as a country within a country, mm. but Westminster, the village of Westminster, that is a country within a country within a country. The people who inhabit that world are so divorced from ordinary life. Well, we see it happening with this, these row and everything else that's been ongoing with you know, this, this, you know, this conference up in Glasgow. I mean, how can you expect such people to be in touch with the concerns of the activists on the ground who are concerned about what is happening, what is being done to this planet in the name of profit, in the name of money, in the name of this unattainable ideal. So I'm tying it all together now. You know. Well, it's the culture of desire, mm -hmm. and desire is unobtainable. It is completely, I mean, it is un you, we desire what? And this is our touch with fire. Um, Jameson goes back to the question of eugenics. It goes back to the question of perfection. It goes back to where did that idea came come from? Well, it's, it, it's a Western idea. It's, it's it's not science. It's an idea um, based upon superiority of one person over the other. But in many cases, um, you know, this is what she touches upon. We are living again in a eugenic society. Designer babies. Mm -hmm. The body beautiful. The must have culture. We must have the instant gratification of an object that we don't even need, that we will probably throw away. Already watching um, TV adverts for Christmas. The perfect family. The perfect unit. Everything is perfect. Everything is stylized. Everything is rehearsed. Everything is is now. We must have this now. Of course, not many people are going to have that. So what happens to the millions upon millions of the millions of people in this country who are not going to be able to celebrate Christmas? What happens to them? They don't matter. Well, that's a. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm getting onto Kafka there, aren't I? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to kind of go back over at this point. I mean, James Davies, in uh, in examining the Western system of psychiatry, as he calls it, describes it as fundamentally unexpo uh, unexportable because of the yeah. way it did. Uh, because I, I, I want to go back into the the, you know, yeah. the, the quote from it here. I mean, I've, I've got. You know, uh, let, let, let's, let's have a look at it. Okay. Western psychiatry. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm quoting from James Davies here. Western psychiatry has just too many fissures in the system to warrant its wholesale exportation. Not just because psychiatric diagnostic manuals are products of culture and science, or because the efficacy of our drugs is far from encouraging, or because behind Western psychiatry lie a variety of cultural assumptions about human nature and the role of suffering, suffering of often questionable validity and utility, or because pharmaceutical marketing can't be relied on to report the facts unadulterated and unadorned, or finally because our exported practices may undermine successful local ways of managing distress. We must think twice before confidently imparting to unsuspecting people around the globe our particular brand of biological psychiatry. Our wholly negative views of suffering, our medicalization of everyday life, and our fearfulness of any emotion that might bring us down. Perhaps ultimately we are investing vast wealth in researching and treating mental illness because unlike many other cultures, we have gradually lost our older belief in the healing powers of community, and in systems that once gave meaning and context to our mental discontent. 
This is a view that commentators like Ethan Waters urge the mental health industry to start taking very seriously. And he says, if our rising need for mental health services does indeed spring from a breakdown of meaning, our insistence that the rest of the world think like us may be all the more problematic. Offering the latest Western mental health theories, treatments and categories in an attempt to ameliorate the psychological, psychological stress sparked by modernization and globalization is not a solution, it may be part of the problem. When we undermine local conceptions of the self and modes of healing, we may be speeding along the disorienting changes that are the very heart of much of the world's mental distress. Now, I see this, 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 is, part, this is part of a kind of a huge thing, it's in a big way, right? You know, a big, you know, this is, a, this is kind of a, a big thing, it's part of a much bigger thing, you know, the in big business of which the exportation of psychiatry is a part, we, you know, we are seeing effectively colonialism repeat itself. Now, there's an exhibition on in London that's uh, on in Somerset House, which I'm planning to go visit, you know, and uh, I, I, I want to look at that. That shows the uh, connection between um, colonialism and unsustainable lifestyles. We're kind of, we, we saw that in that quote I've just, you know, I've just quoted in, uh, you know, just from Cracked here, you know, in the, you know, from, from, James, from James Davies. You know, uh, to, you know, you know, uh, you know, what we're seeing now is kind of like the old, too big business. Okay, it's no longer, you know, governments, you know, or religious, religion-based governments that are, you know, that are colonising, you know, different places. It is big business. Big business is the new coloniser, mm. and it has been for many decades now. And it's, it, you know, and that's, and that, and it's an exportation of, or uh, a biological belief, uh, you know, or biological psychiatry, is fundamentally a part of that, and it is unsustainable. Now, what that has led to, as long with the disenfranchisement of people in third world countries, is the alienation of people in our own societies. Ooh. And this has been happening now for centuries. Now, I'll, before I go into Franz Kafka, I want to look again at another man who was famously alienated, and who added, but, and who, who, and, uh, you know, and this is a guy, Edgar Allan Poe. Now, one of the arguments of, uh, Dar of uh, Darien, new leader of the New Black, I mean, he argues that we've, uh, we no longer you know, turn to psychiatrists or uh, st statistical manuals to understand mental distress. We turn to the artists. We turn to the poets, like your friend there, in touch with the fire. You know, she makes a lot of her work on poets, and that's who we turn to now. The work of not just poets, mm -hmm. but novelists and genuine artists because these people understand human suffering <laughs> in our way that yep. kind of official yeah, busy bodies that also, never will. Also what we return to again is history. Okay. Not the history of empires uh -huh. and how great they were, but the history of what made those empires decline. And it's that to me is incredibly important because all empires decline mostly for one reason corruption within oh my it, it, it's the corruption within not the the mystical enemy outside not the barbarian outside it's in it's within and once that sets in once that corruption sets in a whole heap a whole network of society begins to crumble and it's a fast yeah it's i'm gonna leave it there we'll leave no, that I, until I, I see that i mean i've sensed that i mean mm. as on, on a personal level alfie i have sensed mm. that mm. you know in, in our current political system you're talking about cash for mm. period peerages and mm. cash for your know, honors and, and all this sorts of nonsense that's an example of the corruption within that you are talking mm. about. Yes. Okay, and we've seen it over in the states with Trump, and now, mm. you know, and you know, and you know, it's that it, it, it's continually, even though we've got a, a new president in the White House, that process of corruption is still ongoing. But in this country, in particular, I, I sense it really hard. Mm. I've walked past, as a man, I have walked past the Houses of Parliament many times, and I've sensed it. It is like a sandcastle waiting to crumble. And mm. I say that even though they've spent women how much you know rebuilding it, it is literally like a sandcastle waiting to crumble. But this whole process, this whole I mean, 
what you know, I mean, the reason it falters isn't just because it's it's corrupt, because it's fundamentally dehumanizing. You know, and it's, we have again, and we have sought solace in the arts, which our political masters, mm. ironically, have sought to devalue, have sought to cut. You know, but you know, sought, you know to, uh, because apparently the arts are completely unimportant. That they are extra. That they are surplus. Oh, they can, that they are, so, that, can so, be that they're associated yeah. with with uh, with entertainment. Mm. Sorry. Arts can be used. Oh yeah. The same way that Nazi Germany used the arts with their great exhibition, degenerate arts and Aryan arts. Degenerate arts. There's modern art, modern ideas, modern theories, um, mostly Jewish, um, but all the great artists of the 20th century was degenerate. The best art, of course, was the new man, the Nazi man, alongside the new man in terms of Stalinism, these monumental images that crushed the human soul. You looked up to these images that, are, that lack any form of love and compassion. They are there to crush the human soul. And I think we are moving in that direction. You don't question anything in a totalitarian society. Everything has, has to be top down, top down top down shall we get back to that because otherwise we could run out no, of time I, no uh, mm. you know i want to go into i mean it's the the, the kind of the sense of alienation i mean or that uh, witnessing this whole kind of process from an outsider perspective kind of brings in artists because uh, it's i felt it myself in my own way and i think you have mm. as well alfie and it's we kind of find antecedents with other artists in uh, your know, society, I want to go into Edgar Allan Poe here because you know, and th this is a personal and political thing here. You know, with because uh, Darian, uh, Darian Leader is discussing uh, Edgar Allan Poe here, and this is kind of very vital. And this this is a pertinent statement that he begins this quote with here, and that we and he says here it goes. We tend to repeat things when we remain trapped in them. When Edgar Allan Poe's mother died when he was a boy of almost three, he was left alone in the house overnight with his baby sister and the corpse uh, and the cor until a family benefactor found them. In his work, he returns again and again to the image of the blank stare of the dead and the proximity of death is everywhere. Burials are premature, bodies won't stay dead, dying chambers stretch out to infinity, cadavers rot and decay and blood seeps from a corpse's mouth. Before his own death, the spectre of a ghostly woman that haunts these stories would invade his waking life in a series of terrifying hallucinations. Poe's literary effort to describe this encounter with death from every possible angle suggests that the work of mourning could not be completed. Rather than laying his mother to rest, her presence became increasingly real despite his attempt to transpose the horror what of what had happened to another symbolic level through his writing mm. i mean yeah that is an i mean that is a troubling though that is i mean that is an essential pro you know, process for you know, for an artist you know and i can sense that I, and I can relate to that in my own way mm. i think you can as well mm. i mean one of the things that i'd like to you know to kind of get i mean was maybe just to Kind of start reading some of our own own writing on these podcasts because you know you know because uh, we, we have our own kind of personal comments on this rather than just quoting others. It's great though these artists are be good to kind of quote some of the others, but the, but this but it's, 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 you know, some of our own work. But these these artists kind of convey that sense of alienation and the essential police of the arts in dealing with our own unique psychological states either through creating work or uh, works of art or through using or you're know, consuming or referring to works of art in dealing with our emotional grief uh, because i guess that's well, why his work has lasted because mm. people find a kind of a sense of meaning in it 
I'm going to go into Kafka now, actually, Yeah, Kafka. Please. But I was going to say, th th this is why touch with fire is important. This is why she uses the, word, the words of the poets. Um, and I've got this thing now. I, I think you might have read some of my little bits of writing that I, I put up. The only true historians are the poets and the artists because they work outside the system. Um, history must disturb, it must upset, and it must break down all our existing beliefs about who we are. History has to change and rediscover its original function. And part of that function was to bring in the idea of the myth. So you can question everything that is going on. We are not questioning history anymore. And that is bloody dangerous. Kafka. I Kafka. Now, when well, you see the artists, uh, what you work outside say the system, this is true for a lot of us. But this guy, Franz Kafka, I mean, he worked inside the system. And a friend of mine, he works in, you know, you know, as a friend of mine, a fellow autistic artist. He works inside the system. I think he can identify a lot with Kafka, even though his writing is 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 very different. I mean, he, this is a quote from his diaries. This is the fourth of December, nineteen thirteen. Franz Kafka. And you remember, Franz Kafka worked in an office. Yeah, and it, it kind of the effects of working in that very industrialized way had a profound influence on both himself and his writing. So this is a quote, 4th of December, 1913. This is quite deep. He says, Viewed from the outside, it is terrible for a young but mature person to die, or worse, to kill himself. Hopelessly to depart in a complete confusion that would make sense only within a further development, or with the sole hope that in the great account this appearance in life will be considered as not having taken place. Such would be my plight now. To die would mean nothing else than to surrender a nothing to the nothing. But that would be impossible to conceive, for how could a person, even only as a nothing, consciously surrender himself to the nothing, and not merely to an empty nothing, but rather to a roaring nothing, whose nothingness consists only in its incomprehensibility? A group of men, masters and servants, rough-hewn faces shining with living colours. The master sits down and the servant brings him food on a tray. Between the two there is no greater difference. No difference of another category than, for instance, that between a man who as a result of countless circumstances is an Englishman and lives in London and another who is a Laplander and at the very same time, instant, and the very same instant is sailing on the sea alone in his boat during a storm. Certainly the servant can, and this is only under certain conditions, become a master, but this question, no matter how it may be answered, does not change anything here. For this is a matter that concerns the present evaluation of a present situation. The unity of mankind, now and then doubted, even if only emotionally by everyone, even by the most approachable, adaptable person, on the other hand also reveals itself to everyone, or seems to reveal itself, in the complete harmony, discernible time and again, between the development of mankind as a whole and of the individual man, even in the most secret emotions of the individual. See what he's saying mm. here, the private and the public are very much one. We as a system, we as a people, we are politicians, you know, distant though they are, they, they come out of us, they are in a sense a reflection of us. We are really, we are all in it together. It's the, but our politicians do, our governing classes, to virtue of their rank and assass status, which are all assumed material things, have put themselves above and beyond the rest of us, or try to at least. But eventually, you know, we, we see in them a kind of a reflect. It almost feeds back to us in a loop. We've come to expect, you know, cynicism and corruption from these people, and that is sadly exactly what we get. And it's a kind of an endemic cycle that, you know, seems to kind of go on in, in this country, in, in this society, and this 
I fear personally this is not going to end well. Well, what I'm going to end up my little bit, funny enough, I mentioned um, empires. Um, we look at the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. um, that died, it, it, it's long decline. Um, and it didn't fall, it was a long, long decline. One was the corruption that came from above. Once the elite began to lose contact with its own people, the rot set in. Once the elite began to turn their back on the rule of law, that's when the rot set, set in. Once the constitution of the empire was destroyed, that's when the rot set in. It was all about corruption. The tribes that we read about in popular history who attacked the empire um, were Christian, they were Romanized, um, and they weren't invaders. One of the reasons they turned on the so-called Romans, who didn't exist anymore, was simple. They weren't paid what they were owed. It is that simple. The Germanic tribes were the tribes who guarded the Roman frontiers. They were, I'll repeat, they were Christian and they were Romanized. And all the leaders of those tribes, were Ro they were Roman citizens. History is a lie, but the real history still remains blurred. Corrupt empires die because of the corruptions within not from revolts and we're still living from the effects of that massive disturbance so on, on this happy note yeah uh, <laughs> we we went off on one a bit there but no um, no i mean it's, 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 yeah. it's been a strange session but mm. no we're, it's uh, I, well, we'll hopefully you know produce some interesting you know uh, quotes and insights for you and well I mean it's, 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 it's been a fascinating journey I mean we've been studying this material for weeks and it's you know it's been a, it's been a great it's been a terrific journey for us and well we look forward to continuing it in the new year yes and uh, happy new year folks happy new year folks <laughs>